Hello, welcome to my channel where we discuss the MCC law of cricket. Uh, today we are to discuss law 19 uh, boundaries. Uh, quite a spectacular event, a boundary, a boundary 4 and boundary 6, especially in the days of T20 cricket. Now here goes. Uh, law 19.1 tells us that, uh, as you might remember, in law 2 we were told that the umpires will hold a meeting uh, along with the two captains prior to the start of the match, before the toss rather, and uh, fix the boundaries and decide on the boundary allowances. Uh, this is reiterated here. But there is one very important instruction here which uh, every umpire must note is that no part of the side screen at any stage of the match be within the field of play. They are not allowed to be in the field of play. That is why <coughs> it all adds up. When you arrive early for the match, you and your colleague go around the ground and one of the things that you must observe is whether the side screen is inside or outside the boundary. Can it be shifted out? out if it cannot be shifted out, then you must uh, ensure that a white line is drawn in front of the side screen uh, so that the boundary is moved inwards and the side screen is entirely out. So that would mean that a strike on the uh, direct hit on the side screen would uh, make it a boundary 6. Uh, there are some recommendations about how you should identify and mark the boundary. Identification of boundary is necessary when things are not very clear and the two umpires and the captains have to work together to see uh, what are the marks around there which can be uh, treated as the boundary and then uh, connecting them at least in mind if not physically. So the here 19.2 tells us how uh, the boundaries uh, should be marked. Ideally there should be a continuous white, white line. Uh, you see that in most grounds. Uh, and an object in contact with the ground, the best that we have seen is uh, a rope lying on the ground which is an object uh, in contact with the ground and the rope helps that uh, when the ball hits it, the, uh, the ball jumps and indi it indicates. Now this is the ideal situation and not everywhere is it possible that a continuous white line uh, is drawn or an object in contact, a continuous object in contact with the ground is there rope cannot do there are uh, there are grounds where multiple sports are played and it won't might not be possible to have this so what the law goes on and suggests that if a white line is used it is always the inside edge of that line is a boundary inside of the edge of the line when we discuss creases i mentioned that if the umpire is standing in his bow the bowler the umpire is standing in his position all the edges of creases the inside edge or the back edge including the boundary line, uh, always the inside line is the boundary, is the crease. Uh, so similarly for the boundary line, the crease is the inside line you might say and the rest of it is the boundary marking which is supposed to be outside the boundary. Therefore, if the ball hits that uh, boundary uh, white uh, line, it is uh, boundary 6. So that is how it is. and. Uh, uh, wherever a combination, it can be, we can always uh, use uh, flags and posts or a board in combination of the white line merely to highlight uh, the boundary, to make it more visible uh, and in such a case it is best to place these flags or boards outside the boundary line and not inside and uh, make sure that when you go on your round the f flag doesn't, uh, is the flag is not too long and it doesn't flap inside. Uh, inside the boundary line. Try and avoid uh, being if it is of made of stiff material, a flag of stiff material and not cloth, uh, you can uh, turn it the other way. And that will be only an indicator to show that this is where the boundary line is. It helps, it helps in visibility, that is all, but it is not part of the boundary. Now an object when that is in contact with the ground is used, the boundary will be the inside edge of that object. Suppose there is a six inch or four inch brick inlay which has been placed along the boundary that marks the boundary and uh, that stops the ball then in that case the uh, edge in contact with the ground is the boundary so it if it hits at any point higher than that uh, any point higher than the bottom edge it is a boundary six and not a boundary four so uh, these are the rules that have to be kept in uh, mind now we, we see those triangular boards nowadays which are covering the boundary rope that are being used. 
it is always the bottom edge which is in contact with the ground of that triangular of that triangular uh, plastic piece which is the boundary and the rest of it of course we have seen in television uh, nowadays it's uh, shown quite uh, commonly that when the ball pitches on top of that uh, object which is used to mark the ground mark the boundary it is a boundary 6 and not a boundary 4 uh, now uh, uh, yes flags posts or boards can be used to mark uh, specific points on the boundary where a continuous uh, marking is not possible like i mentioned then uh, a continuous marking is not possible uh, in a lot of places uh, where uh, that lower levels of cricket then in that case it is suggested that flags and boards or uh, objects should be marked uh, at specific point should be used at specific point when you are doing it an important instruction here is for the umpire is that we are so long used to imagining a curve the boundary is in a curve so we imagine from point to point we imagine a curve being a curved line being a boundary the law presently says if there are two flags if there are two flags in close proximity to each other it is the straight line from flag to flag or object to object which should be used uh, it is an imaginary line but you must imagine a straight line and accordingly you declare the boundary and judge whether or not the uh, boundary uh, has been scored it is do not do not take suppose there are two flags which are a little distance apart from each other when they are too close uh, flat or uh, uh, flat or uh, curved doesn't make any difference but when they are far away uh, if you take a curved line the depth of the boundary may be anything up to three feet so the law says these instructions are very clear point to point it is a straight line that you have to imagine as being the boundary uh, where it is undefined in several places there is no boundary defined it is not possible to define a boundary by placing flags or objects even there a match can go on in that case uh, the two umpires and the uh, captains will decide on certain uh, marks there on the ground or the, a tree somewhere in one corner uh, a piece of rock somewhere and a uh, grassy patch uh, there on a the otherwise bare ground which are indications that this is where and then you take a straight line from those and carry on with the game uh, we are we are talking about uh, the top level conditions and going downwards towards uh, the grassroot level where it is not possible to have these uh, markings and all that and uh, there are a lot of cricket played uh, at those levels and the laws cater for them uh, now the uh, law tells us about an object or uh, uh, an obstacle within the field of play whenever you whenever you go to umpire a uh, match at some school ground where it is used for multiple purposes there is a cricket pitch there is a football pitch close by there is a hockey pitch <coughs> and there might be a uh, rugby pitch and uh, there might be goalposts uh, of these three sports within the boundary or for all you know then one uh, corner there might be a badminton uh, court which has uh, two uh, uh, poles for the nets now in such cases you have to decide uh, before the toss by the umpires whether these are to be regarded as a boundary or not uh, as you go on uh, when you have that pre-match meeting uh, like I told you it is important for you to look around the ground arrive early at the ground all of these I will keep repeating uh, uh, that you arrive early at the ground talk to your colleague both of you can go around and look around the ground and these are the things that you can observe and uh, think about overhanging trees is one thing I mentioned that if there are overhanging trees uh, near the boundary edge you have to make a note of those and so with that when the ball strikes that overhanging tree it is a boundary 6 because it gets comes into contact with uh, something which is uh, grounded outside the boundary line uh, now you also look out for certain objects uh, obstacles within the boundary field of play for which you will have to take a decision before the toss how you are going to treat it whether it is a boundary or not you will have to decide so inform the two umpires and this has to be followed throughout the match uh, if you do not do it it cannot be a boundary uh, and you cannot uh, it cannot be as you go along you make a decision as you go along that is not allowed you have to make a decision early and now uh, there is uh, 
uh, very often we see that a, uh, a person or animal or object uh, come onto the field of play come onto the field of play what this should the umpire do then the umpires are now instructed now an object object is in inserted in uh, the third edition 2022 where otherwise it used to be a person or animal only but an object is also inserted in the law the umpires have may determine otherwise now they can be it may be it is not normally regarded as a boundary normally an object or person normally not regarded as a boundary but they are empowered the umpires have been empowered under the law that they may otherwise determine otherwise they may treat it as a boundary for each separate occurrence if the facts of the matter will differ from uh, occurrence to occurrence may differ from occurrence to occurrence there cannot be a standard uh, dictate which says that if it's uh, an object uh, or person or uh, animal uh, obstructs the ball on its way to the boundary it is always to be given a boundary there is no uh, it is the it is left free to the umpires to judge the situation that at the time uh, contact between the ball and such person or element is made they will they are uh, supposed to decide on that basis what is to be done about it is to be decided here you uh, there is a reference to law 20.4.212 umpire calling and signaling dead ball they uh, under this law they can call it a boundary and a cross reference to law 20 calling dead ball uh, suggests and tells us and we uh, read the next law law 20 this particular uh, uh, this particular clause they may even in certain circumstances where they feel that the one of the sides has been disadvantaged by the ball being stopped because it has been the cause of a run out they can call even call dead ball so they can either call it a boundary treat it as a boundary depending on certain circumstances they may treat it otherwise from instance to instance and again uh, they are simultaneously they are also given the power to call it a dead ball in case they feel that uh, one of the two sides has been disadvantaged uh, by this uh, particular obstruction uh, and uh, i had an example from my so both of these laws go together there is no uh, real clash if you look at it closely you can apply both of these together uh, either it could be a could be a boundary or it could be a, a dead ball or should be uh, neither neither or carry on and play carry on play i'm not giving a boundary and no side is disadvantaged so therefore i will not call dead ball carry on and play that is how you don't have to do uh, either of the two you may miss out on either of both of them i had an example from my uh, playing career in bombay we were playing at a ground kangali match and uh, the boundary being not too far it was a small ground there not very uh, wide and uh, the striker hit the ball uh, of the back foot to cover and unfortunately a dog uh, sort of stopped it and it hit his chest and he went away squealing and the ball stopped dead somebody picked up and threw the ball and uh, ran out the uh, one strike now it was a clear uh, those there were no laws uh, of this kind uh, uh, at that time and uh, i had to give the batsman out now you judge whether it's just right or not not but in the maybe in the present uh, the light of present regulations uh, it might not have been right but i had no law to justify my action of calling dead ball or uh, giving a boundary there wasn't anything i had to allow the game to progress as it did and unfortunately one of the batters got out but now this is a case where uh, certainly most certainly the batting side is disadvantaged and the umpire would be absolutely within his rights to call dead ball and not allowing any action and if of course if the uh, ball the, the interception by that dog would have been a little close to the boundary line and no fielder close by to uh, field it or get behind the ball no fielder behind the ball or no no fielder who could get behind the ball uh, i could be justified in allowing the boundary so both of these examples uh, go together and uh, there is no uh, they are not uh, opposite opposite they go together fine this is how it uh, would work now we come we come to the question of uh, restoring a boundary we have seen very often it happens that uh, uh, when a 
player players uh, the ground being so good nowadays players tend to slide when they are uh, next to the boundary line and uh, when they are chasing the ball and uh, uh, they uh, uh, at times drag the ropes uh, up to 6 feet away behind or we may find that the ropes uh, come in for some reason or other now whenever a solid object is used to mark the boundary it is disturbed for any reason it's uh, whatever solid object may be used it may be the rope or it may be the rope and the triangular boards which are there uh, it disturbed and it gets displaced either comes in or come goes out uh, it shall be considered the boundary shall be considered to be in its original position the umpire has to judge the uh, say for instance the ball the uh, fielder has dragged the slid feet first and taken the boundary line uh, along with him the boundary remains where the rope originally was the rope originally was and if the ball has crossed that point uh, a boundary would be awarded uh, this is nothing that a uh, field umpire can see from that distance uh, he can't judge it so minutely but this is an instruction a uh, third umpire uh, should know and judge accordingly the boundary line though the marking is displaced the object used to mark is displaced the boundary line remains in its original position this object shall be returned to its original position as soon as it is practical of course when the ball is dead if placed there this shall be done as soon as the ball is dead as it is said it should be replaced uh, and it is this is so important that you shouldn't allow play to progress till that has happened shouldn't allow play to progress till that has happened to avoid the uh, basic problem then if some part of a fence or other marker has come into the field of play they should be removed from the field of play as soon as practicable or as soon as the ball is there this is uh, what is uh, has been stated about displacement of the object which uh, restoring the boundary displacement of an object which is used to mark the boundary uh, and uh, there could be other things sir uh, for example about the person animal or object that we uh, think can think about uh, somebody has uh, thrown a large balloon into the ground or a large flag into the ground and the ball goes and strikes it these are uh, examples of an object which uh, come onto the field of play so these are the things that have you to come to uh, these are regarding the law 19 boundaries uh, the basic about the marking of the boundary uh, what of what things are used for marking a boundary what an umpire shall do one important thing is the side screen should never be inside the boundary line and also that point to point whether uh, there is an unmarked boundary point to point you may have it as a curve if you want if there is a rope but if there is not no marking on the line uh, and there are markers used at from at different spaces you umpires are instructed to not to imagine the boundary in a curved line but in a straight line uh, from one object to the other one marking one flag to the other this is supposed to make things easier for the umpire uh, and it certainly does i think this is what should be followed by all umpires uh now we come to what is uh, uh, how uh, why is there the boundary the ball grounded beyond the boundary what is it supposed to mean now the ball can be treated is uh, treated as grounded beyond the boundary it is treated as grounded beyond the boundary it is within the field of play and now it has become grounded beyond the boundary that means in other words you can say for ease of use uh, reached beyond the boundary and that is why a boundary uh, is scored so let us try and uh, you uh, experiment with the term uh, used uh, uh, reach the boundary uh, during our explanation here reach the boundary which means the same thing as grounded beyond the boundary if it has it is reach the boundary if it touches now through the ball we have different uh, situations here the ball itself reaches the boundary when is it supposed to have reached the boundary when it has come uh, into contact it touches the boundary which is the line at this inner edge of the line or any object used to mark the boundary so we all very well know this the ball goes and reaches the boundary it therefore uh, has reached the boundary therefore it is a boundary 4 or 6 whatever it may be we'll come to those the scoring later uh, or uh, 
the ground beyond the boundary. It has gone and bounced on the, not touched the object of the boundary, but it uh, has come in contact with the ground beyond the boundary or any object grounded beyond the boundary. It could very well be a, it could be a person or it could, uh, most often it is a tree which has, is grounded beyond the boundary but it has overhanging trees, uh, uh, trees overhanging the boundary line and coming up to 3, 4, 5, 10, 15 feet uh, inside the boundary line and the ball goes and strikes that, uh, the branches of that tree, it, the ball is dead because it has reached the boundary. Uh, it will be not, uh, noted that under this regulation the ball has reached the boundary and therefore a boundary has to be scored. Boundary has and uh, uh, there are situations where a ball has been picked up by the fielder and he throws it back. Uh, contact with the, that overhanging branches would uh, mean that the ball has reached the boundary and it has reached from an overthrow, a throw, willful act of the fielder, it would be an overthrow, be treated as an overthrow. So, uh, what I suggest is that like I come to this again and again, your uh, round across the boundary to identify these trouble spots you might call them. The law has uh, regulations uh, about how to treat these various things. Fine. So we know that the boundary is scored, a boundary ball, when the ball reaches the boundary, when, the, when is the ball treated as grounded beyond the boundary, the ball has reached the boundary uh, by actually touching the boundary line, by touching the ground outside the boundary line and uh, touching any object which is grounded beyond the boundary line, any object which is grounded beyond the boundary, fine? We see examples of this all the while. Uh, but this is just to reiterate what we already know. Now the ball in place to be regarded as being grounded beyond the boundary. Now it is via a fielder, via a fielder also, a ball is deemed to have reached the boundary. When physically the ball hasn't reached the boundary, but it is deemed to be have reached the boundary via a fielder also. If the fry fielder himself is grounded beyond the boundary when he comes in contact with the ball seen many examples of it, somebody on the line has a fielder touch the ball, he is in uh, simultaneous contact, he is in simultaneous contact with the uh, boundary line and with the ball, uh, the ball is deemed to have reached the boundary or is now grounded beyond the boundary and a boundary will be scored. And also a fielder who after catching the ball uh, uh, within the boundary becomes grounded beyond the boundary while in contact before uh, completing the catch. This will uh, bring us to the study of uh, the law concerning completion of the catch, caught, where uh, completion of catch is defined, which uh, to tell you now, it says that uh, a catch is uh, start, the uh, action of taking a catch starts on the first uh, time the uh, fielder first comes in contact with the ball till the time he has gained complete control over the ball and of his own uh, bodily movements. So it could very well happen that the fielder catches the ball but since he is not in uh, control of his and he is that momentum of his carries him uh, beyond the boundary uh, before he, uh, he has gained control, uh, the ball is deemed to be uh, have reached the boundary or if ball is treated as grounded beyond the boundary. Again, we have seen many examples of this. Uh, you can see it before your eyes that these things are there. Just to reiterate that it is the ball itself, the ball via the fielder. Ball via the fielder. Now there is any situation, there is another situation uh, when now uh, it tells us also, now it tells us, it goes on further to tell us the law. When is that fielder treated to be grounded beyond the boundary? When is a fielder who is inside but is treated to be beyond the boundary? When is that fielder treated so? We have learned that via the fielder he can. Now let us see when that fielder himself, there are a set of circumstances where the fielder himself will be considered to be outside, uh, grounded beyond the boundary. And therefore when he comes in such a fielder, a simultaneous contact with the ball, the ball has reached the boundary. That is what it says. He is in contact with the boundary line. The fielder is in contact with the boundary line or any object used to you mark the boundary. As a rope lying there, the foot is on the rope, he is grounded outside. Uh, grounded 
beyond the boundary, marked as boundary. The, he touches the ground beyond the boundary. One foot of his is outside the on the ground beyond the boundary. Uh, an object that is in contact with the ground beyond the boundary. Now he is in contact, say, with the. Uh, uh, there is a tree stump outside the boundary, and somehow he con uh, he raises a uh, he places a foot on it when uh, catching the ball or fielding the ball. Places a foot on it, and in that case, or like I mentioned to you, when there is a flag which uh, which flaps inwards, or it is a rigid flag with rigid material used, please ensure that the flag itself is turned outward. Or if it is something that can flap, uh, it should never flap within. Try to um, take it about six inches out, so that a fielder at the close to the boundary line should not come in contact with the flapping flag, uh, which might be moving due to the wind. And uh, his uh, uh, calf um, might brush against that and cause a problem. And it would be a boundary. Now, when he is in uh, contact with such a flag, which is which has come partially inside and at the same time he comes in contact with the ball and he's trying to feel the ball he will be treated as grounded beyond the boundary and the ball uh, has reached the boundary and also green so these are the cases where now one very important thing is uh, stated here one very important circumstance we have had it seen uh, once or twice in international cricket uh, and especially T20, with bang of T20 cricket, we have seen it recently. Very interesting. Now, a ball can be treated as uh, having reached the boundary by itself via a fielder, and now the ball and the fielder via fielder via another fielder. So it will be a connection of sorts between A, B, and C. But there are certain circumstances. Uh, where, uh, which, which, uh, uh, where it is possible. That circumstance is explained here. Uh, it could very well be that there is a fielder, there are two fielders coming uh, to catch a ball. One of them slips and uh, is lying astride the boundary rope. He is lying astride the boundary rope. Half his body is inside, half the body is inside, uh, outside. <coughs> and the fielder who is actually fielding the ball or taking the catch is in contact with uh, the fielder who is grounded now, grounded beyond the boundary. Now whether or not this is to be treated as a connection to the boundary, ball to fielder to boundary is left to the umpire to judge. If the umpire considers that it was the intention of either fielder that the contact should assist in the fielding of the ball that fielder is treated as grounded beyond the boundary. And that fielder is treated uh, beyond the boundary. So there has to be an intent to assist in the fielding, help in making. He suppose if that uh, guy is propping up the uh, fielder who is trying to field the ball or taking the catch, propping him up. Here he is providing assistance in the fielding or the catching of the ball. But he is merely lying on the ground and uh, not doing anything in the umpire's view to assist in the fielding, that connection from ball to fielder to fielder to boundary line is not reckoned as a boundary. But if that uh, there is, uh, his intention is to provide that uh, assistance, uh, then that connection is established and the ball will have though far away from the boundary line, is in contact with another fielder who in turn is in contact with a fielder who is grounded beyond the boundary with the intention of, solely with the intention of assisting in uh, yeah, fielding the ball. In such a case, the ball will be treated as that connection will be complete. Otherwise, that connection, though present, will be disregarded. That connection from ball to fielder to fielder to boundary, though present, will be disregarded because the intent was not there. But the intent was not there. The connection from ball to fielder to second fielder to boundary line is established and will be uh, deemed as ball reach the boundary. That is the rule and it is an important rule to um, a lot of uh, field umpire, uh, the third umpire has a big uh, tough job in front of him.
now there is one more interesting part which says that there there can be many times a fielder who has is not in contact with the ground when he first comes in contact with the ball now he jumped up to take a catch he is jumped up to take a catch or jumped up to take a field there's a ball that is uh, bounced and it has jumped up uh, bounces in front of him jumps up and this man also jumps up now he is not in contact he when he comes in contact with the ball he is not in contact with the ground the law instructor now solely this particular fielder who is not in contact with the ground when he uh, first comes in touch contact with the ball so when he first touches the ball the umpire will go back to see what was his last position before he took that jump what was his last position before he took that jump to handle the ball his first contact with the ball what was his last position if that last position was within the ground within the boundary it is of no consequence but if that last uh, contact with the ground was out outside the boundary or in contact with the ground he was grounded beyond the boundary say standing on the rope he was standing on the rope and from there he jumped up and uh, such a person who is not in contact with the ball when he touches the ball uh, you have to go back to see what was his last contact whether within inside within the uh, ground or outside the ground and you will rule likewise we have seen many examples i remember a scene in a test match i think it was that uh, test match or international uh, where uh, indian bowler uh, bumrah uh, for some reason uh, backed away slightly and uh, when the ball was being he, he backed up and he found both his feet were uh, heels were on the uh, triangular uh, boundary and he from there he jumped up and quite uh, obviously Uh, that was a case of boundary six. He caught the ball, but then it wasn't allowed because, and he jumped up in the air. Now, when that man jumps up in the air, his last contact was within or outside is to be judged, and accordingly the ruling to be given. Uh, we have other examples also. And uh, now coming to boundary allowances. Uh, before the toss, the umpire and captain shall determine the runs to be allowed for boundary. Mo all cases, in all cases, generally. it is uh, a boundary 6 or boundary 4 and now boundary 6 and boundary 4 is a nomenclature only uh, you can decide uh, uh, the number of runs to be given by it could be 5 and 3 also or it could be 4 and 4 uh, mm -hmm. this you will be guided the captains will be guided by the prevailing custom of the ground a lot of grounds uh, have a custom that uh, they are suppose they are village ground now uh, let me uh, reiterate that these laws don't cover only the top level of the game they cover all levels right up to the grassroots level where uh, these things happen uh, and the boundary line is not clear or the boundary line uh, the grounds have their own uh, customs about uh, the allowances to be given for runs uh, it could very well happen that the ground is lined uh, beyond the boundary by residences uh, people live there with glass windows and all and they would want to discourage the hitting of sixes so why does one hit a six to get the maximum allowance uh, so they do not allow uh, uh, six runs for that boundary hit over the boundary so as to discourage it so it will not be fruitful for him though he will be less inclined to hit it but that is not always doesn't always succeed but uh, even if it is uh, there the custom of the ground should be followed by the instructor to do that doesn't happen at the higher levels of the game but most certainly very very frequently it can happen that uh, we had a small ground in uh, bombay wilson college in khana which has one side the boundary is very close and i remember doing an a division time shield match uh, where uh, the, the captains fixed the boundary for the, that was only four instead of two it was only four uh, instead of four it was only two runs whatever we the allowance the nomenclature will still be boundary 6 boundary 4 just to dis differentiate between the two now runs scored from boundaries uh, a boundary is a six we all know that the ball without having touched the ground or bounced on the within the ground ground has grounds itself outside the boundary line 
in all the recognized any of the recognized way recognized ways and without first bouncing within the fielding area uh, firstly it has to be struck by the bat under no circumstances is a boundary 6 allowed uh, for a leg by or where is no no contact uh, with the bat of the striker we see have seen many occasions recently where the ball has bounced uh, a bit and has come in contact with the helmet of the uh, striker and gone away for uh, to the boundary and pitched beyond the boundary in such a case it would always be a boundary 6 uh, boundaries a uh, boundary 4 a boundary 6 can only be given if it has been struck by the bat and it first ground itself outside the boundary uh, even if the ball uh, has first touched the fielder a uh, fielder has made an attempt to catch it and it uh, uh, drops out of his hand and goes uh, it is still a boundary 6 the laws clarify this two things to remember even if it has first touched the fielder the ball itself shouldn't be grounded uh, in any of the ways now we have seen even brushing the overhanging branches would ground it beyond and then the fielder catches it it would be a 6 and uh, even if a fielder has previously touched these are the principles that one has to understand it has to be struck by the bat is very important thing uh, a boundary 4 of course we all know that it first uh, grounds the uh, bounces within the boundary and then it goes uh, reaches the boundary and grounds itself beyond the boundary in the various ways that have been uh, uh, stated in this law uh, and also a ball which which is uh, not uh, been struck by the bat ground itself beyond the boundary is going to be four runs like i explained the ball hits and uh, there have been known cases where the ball has bounced so much that is pitched itself uh, or has there been or am i, am I imagining it that <laughs> uh, now when a boundary is scored the batting side except in the cases of 19.8 now we come to two very important provisions 19.7.3 and 19.8 i'd like you to pay particular attention to the provisions of these uh, two clauses now i would bring i want to bring your focus to the phrase except in the circumstances of 19.8 which makes it amply clear that 19.7.3 does not apply to 19.8 what does 19.8 uh, tell you i will come in a minute it talks about overthrows So in an overthrow situation, 19.7.3 doesn't apply. 19.8 situation, overthrow situation has its own set of rules which has to be applied. So what does 19.7.3 says? That whenever the ball has reached the boundary or the boundary is scored, now whichever boundary, six or four, whatever, whenever it is scored, the allowance, what will be allowed, will be the allowance for the boundary. there is no way uh, we are going to they are going to run more than 6 of course but uh, they will be allowed the allowance for the boundary and the run completed the runs completed by the batters together with the run in progress if they had already crossed the instant the boundary is concerned if whichever is the greater of these two 19.7.3 says that you they you have got two parameters before you one is the boundary allowance and the second you will also look at the uh, runs which have been taken if runs taken are greater than the boundary allowed you will allow it how do you reckon uh, the runs uh, taken at the instant of the ball reaches the boundary you have to look at how many runs they have run and this will include also the fifth run provided they have crossed in their effort of running in a slow sluggish ground and the field being closed by and uh, it is found that the ball is gone and is all clearly going to reach the boundary and then somebody has to run from there here there can be circumstances where uh, four and a half plus runs are run to put it differently four and crossed in the fifth it is five runs that will count and not four runs. so the greater of the two has always to be applied the greater of the two has always got to be applied in these circumstances in the normal circumstances it's a rare occurrence doesn't happen often uh, good well trimmed grounds and all that and uh, in uh, the kind of uh, stuff on the sun kind of surfaces that top level cricket is played we hardly get to see it but there are a lot of places where this can happen it does happen uh, especially with the wet conditions and there is some kind of obstruction there which 
happens to halt the ball and nobody running after it because it was a sure boundary. Mm. Then somebody gives chase. In the meantime, the batsmen keep running. Four and a half and crossed will mean five. Remember this, yeah. run in progress will count provided they have crossed. If they have not crossed, so the, that will not count. And the position of the two batters will be according to the runs which are given. If boundary is given, the striker will take strike to the next ball. If you are allowing five, naturally the when you allow five runs, you also keep this position also of the two batters. I would say that uh, batter returning to the wicket he has left shall apply <coughs> as per that situation at the instant when the ball. Now, uh, here is an important provision 19.7.5 the scoring of penalty runs by either side is not affected by the scoring of a boundary. Uh, just because a boundary is scored does not mean that a penalty uh, should not be awarded. So this is a principle perhaps uh, in at a later stage uh, uh, when uh, you think about uh, 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 whether the boundary and the fire and penalty can be given. Yes, it can be given. This law very clearly says this is so. Uh, a boundary allowance of five, four or six runs can coexist along with the fire and penalty. Both of them can apply depending on the situation and uh, this rule amply uh, clears it. Similarly, we got we'll come to 41.17 where penalty laws, uh, an act, unfair act which uh, is punishable by penalty, that penalty should always be given whether or not, even if the match is completed. So all of these things uh, we'll discuss in detail uh, in a later chapter. Now, for the moment, just make a note of this particular provision, 19.7.5. Now I got 19.7.3, 19.7.4, they shall replace the boundary along for the purpose of this and now coming to 19.8, overthrows or willful act of a fielder. Now you have got to differentiate between what is an overthrow, here he picks up the ball and throws the ball. The overthrow doesn't have to be in the direct intended direction, it could go haywire, it could go this way, that way. The idea is that the fielder has thrown the ball. It could go backward. It loses. Con he does this when he pulls his hand back. It he loses control of it. Goes backward. It's going to be uh, an overthrow, and uh, doesn't have to be on the overthrow. Does not have to be uh, outside the on the opposite side of the ground. It can be on the same side of the ground. So all of that doesn't matter. The basic thing is there is uh, throw made by a fielder who has fielded the ball and has attempted to throw it and it then crosses uh, as a result of that action it crosses the boundary line then the second thing here to note is about another willful act willful act of a fielder uh, these uh, we have seen examples of this uh, where a player uh, in at the top level also perhaps we have seen uh, where a player uh, a weak batter and a strong batter are there towards the end of an innings and the uh, fielding side would rather that the weak batsman uh, uh, plays, plays the next ball. So it can very well happen that the fielder kicks the ball out uh, of the ground. These things are also, this is also, this regulation 19.8 will also apply to such a willful act. This is a willful act on the part of the member of the fielding side and will be treated on uh, at on level with an overthrow. So what happens when we see such uh, the boundary results from an overthrow or willful act of a fielder? Uh, when a boundary uh, results from an overthrow or from the act of a fielder, the willful act, it has to be willful, not accidental, and uh, the runs completed by the batter at the instant of the overthrow or the willful act, which may be two, three, four, three crossed means four, uh, all of that, including the run in progress if already crossed, at the instant of the throw on the act, shall be scored together with the allowance for the boundary. The allowance for the boundary is four runs, and uh, in addition to that, whatever runs have been scored uh, in before that action of throwing, 
before the action of throwing or kicking the ball across the boundary the number of runs scored at that instant will have to be noted by the umpires either or both uh, mostly it is the square leg umpire who makes a note of that but then either can uh, do it and uh, say if they have crossed for three and a half which will reckon as four so run in progress will count again uh, will count depending on whether they have counted crossed or not and at the instant whatever is the position of the bat the two batters will have to be retained because it tells us the law 18 12 2 shall apply from the instant of the willful throw or willful overthrow or a willful act so you will retain the position of three uh, two and a half have been run you are allowing three plus uh, three plus four seven so you will retain the position uh, even though a boundary has been scored you will retain the position of the two batsmen at the instant of the throw uh, umpires, we have seen umpires making uh, mistakes about this but and this is something which uh, in our uh, teaching days, in our learning days, we were, uh, it was ground into our heads, so to say, that these are the things that you must look for and spot immediately uh, and uh, especially when a ball has been hit in the air and is caught, your eye should immediately switch to the note the position of the two batters. Of course, it doesn't matter now because uh, that crossing has no meaning, but here it does. And uh, I would want that the umpire should be conscious of this, especially the square leg umpire should be conscious if the other guy is watching a catch or something, he might not spot it. But even then, both of you, it is uh, bo for both of you that you come, you note what is the position of the uh, two batters in running uh, whenever such an overthrow or willful act comes. And consultation uh, in case of uh, anything uh, difficult, uh, you are not sure you can always consult your colleague. So this brings us to the end of this uh, law, uh, somewhat wrong law, wrong law. And uh, we will then go on to law 20 after this. Uh, read up, please read up law 20, dead ball. And we'll go on to that uh, in, in some time. Bye. In our next episode. Bye.